So, um, Nathan, thank you for the, the invite uh, to talk about radio access. I'm a big fan of radio access. We developed this not only here at MUSC, but in the country, and why not to say globally. Uh, I've been deeply involved in radio access uh, with different companies, and I think this is uh, a very important thing for you guys to get involved with, or at least to learn about because that's the future. I have no doubt about that uh, in terms of access. Patients love it. Uh, cardiology learned over the years, that's the way to go. Just to give you an idea, uh, recently this year and in 2016 and then this year, in Europe and in US uh, respectively, there are publications from the societies of cardiology in both European and US the saying that radio access should be the preferred access for coronary interventions. And I have no doubt that in the future, we're going to be considering, our society will be considering radio access to be the preferred access as well. I want to make sure that this is a uh, an open dialogue. This is not a formal lecture. So if anybody wants to interrupt me, just uh, ask a question. Sounds like a plan? Good. So let's move on. So these are my conflicts of interest. So everything started with this case back in 2013. So we've been doing radio access now for almost uh, nine years. And basically you can see this patient with very obese uh, with uh, inguinal hernia on the left. We did a left SFA recanalization sticking the right common femoral artery. Everything went well until the end of the case when we needed to hold pressure for about an hour and 15 minutes of this groin, patient developed a massive hematoma. And that day I realized we have to do something different. And if you compare the amount of fat, for example, those two, these are two different patients, but think about this patient on the left, on the right side of this, of the, on the, with the radio axis. Doesn't matter the, 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 the amount of BMI, you know, there will be, there won't, won't have more than one centimeter, one and a half centimeters between the skin and the radio artery in a very, very obese patient. Typically it's a few millimeters. However, we have seen up to seven, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 11 centimeters, basically four and a half inches between the femoral artery the common femoral artery in the skin. So that's, of course, increased the risk of bleeding complications. So why to use radioactive? So what are the real advantages, right? We learned along the way, we did also did a randomized prospective clinical trial at MUSC back in 2016, published at the JVIR. And we learned that the patients preferred radio access. For the patient's perspective, every five patients, four prefer radio access allows immediate ambulation, shorten, uh, short, shorter length of stay, can charge the patients faster, you have less excess site complications, especially bleeding, <coughs> and mobility is important. If you are a patient, you wanna, would you like to be seated for, or keep your legs straight down for between, you know, two to six hours, or would you like to be able to sit up, walk around, you know, read a magazine, read a book, uh, ex have free access to the restroom, or be stuck in a bed for that amount of time. So I think it's, it's no brainer, right, to consider why patients prefer radio access. Dr. Gamirez? So, yes. This might be a silly question, but when you guys did this study, um, was this people that had the uh, patients that had experience with femoral access, or was this their first IR procedure and you just kind of gave them the option, or like how did they know which ones they preferred? That's a fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, basically, we did a prospective randomized study with intra and interpatient control. Uh, at that time, we were doing more blend and chemoembolizations, and typically require two to three sessions in order to have tumor control. Um, and so these patients, all of them had at least two procedures. Most of them have three procedures. So if they were randomized, let's say, to radio first, and then the second procedure was automatically femoral. If they were randomized to femoral first, the second procedure was automatically radio. Make sense? 
So they had, every patient had both accesses. And as most of them had a third procedure, they needed to select for us and say, I want to have femoral or I want to have radial. So the patient selected. So that's why I'm saying that there was intra and interpatient control. And the ones that did not require us a third procedure, they we asked them if you had to have this procedure done again, which one would you like to go for? And every five patients for four prefer radio access. Does it make sense? Yes, that's a great study design. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Thank you. So in terms of anatomy, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. So in terms of anatomy, also is easier to come from above. For example, the other day we're doing a UFE, a ut uh, uterine fibroid embolization procedure. It takes, you know, super fast to come from radio, go all the way down to the aorta and then navigate down to the hypogastric arteries without a problem, without any problem. Uh, the same thing in, is in tortuous uh, SMA or celiac vessels or renal arteries that can be tough to come from above, as you can see on the on the red rings. You can see how tough it can be to go through those stenoses and the occlusion, but it'll be way easier if you come from above. Now, from the coagulation status standpoint, as you guys know, we do a lot of liver-directed therapy, and a lot of those patients have uh, comorbidity related to liver dysfunction, so it's increased INR and low platelets. We have done cases of INR up to 4.2 and platelets as low as 12,000, but always one of the two parameters have to be normal. Also need to take into account uh, that, you know, one of the two parameters have to be normal in order to be able to, to be, uh, to not change to not give transfusion of platelets and to not give FFP or plasma to correct INR. Of course, you need to take into account fibrinogen as well. But in this case, uh, we were just uh, uh, measuring INR and platelets at that time. So what we do, what we have done over the years is we have not we have not transfused platelets anymore or give any blood products to correct the coagulopathy for radio access because they, these people don't bleed. If the patient bleeds, which is rare, after the case, we'd give FFP or or uh, FFP or plasma or 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 platelets to the patients that really need to have uh, uh, have bleeding. So we don't spend time up front. And here's the thing: we don't spend time up front, or don't waste time up front uh, with blood transfusions. We don't spend money necessarily in transfusing people that don't need it. So from the from the cost economic standpoint, from an economic standpoint, there is a savings of about four hundred dollars for the hospital. For the patients, it's thousands of dollars for for a, a one pack of platelets. Not to mention the time, the delay in patient care. It can be up to four hours between detecting that the patient has low platelets or high NR. Type and cross, give the transfusion, check it again. It's about four hours. So major deal for patient care. This paper demonstrates that if the patient is anticoagulated or not, the incidence of complications is way, way higher in the femoral group versus the radio group. This this paper, on the other hand, that was focused on comparing patients that had transfusion or low transfusion, uh, had transfusion or no transfusion when they are thrombo with thrombocytopenia. And was, what was detected is that it doesn't really make any difference in terms of the complication rates. So it's very low regardless, so don't need to be transfused. Regarding optimization of resources, uh, one thing that we, this is a, just a concept that we wanted to implement at NUSC. Think about this, uh, the left to lower quadrant picture has two beds, the two uh, bays basically with the beds inside. If you tear down the middle wall, you can put in the same physical space for recliner. So you basically duplicate capacity. Instead of having two, bay, two beds in two bays, you duplicate the capacity putting in four recliners. And instead of having one nurse to recover two patients, you can rec one nurse can recover four patients because it's much easier to recover radio access. Um, so basically, there is an op opportunity to optimize space and human resources. This is the publication that I was talking about. 
from published at the JVIR back in 2017. And um, this is the paper when we learned two major things. One is every five patients, uh, four prefer radio access. The, more, the other thing that we learned from this study is that if you use the way, if you perform radio access with the, with the way we do with the arm open about 45 or 90 degrees, and you put a shield like a door on wheels, a shield to radiation between the radiation source and yourself, then there is a, a drop in threefold in reduction. There's a threefold reduction in radiation exposure to the operator, not to the patient, but to the operator, which is a big deal. Um, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis that analyzed uh, back in 2019. A couple of uh, papers, uh, basically they studied nine studies that compare radio versus femoral in peripheral interventions, all in liver-directed therapy. About 1,000 patients, four or 500 patients in each group, and what they saw is that, again, the same thing as we had in our, pay, in our population. The primary endpoint was patient satisfaction, and our, similar to our study, the vast majority, every five patients, four prefer radio access. There's a little longer procedure time because some of those studies included radio access from the first, from like from the first few patients. Instead of learning from the learn, going through a learning curve, learning how to do the case, and then start to do the study, they started to include patients since the get-go. That's why the, there's a little bit of longer procedure time, but it's not significant after you go through the learning curve. And no difference in radiation to the patients, not to the operator, to the patient. No difference in fluoroscopy time, no difference in contrast volume or in the incidence of complications. So how can you use, what can you uh, use radio access for? Over the years, we have done many cases of chemoembolization, Y90. When I say chemoembolization, over the years, uh, over four years period, I've done up to seven radio access in the same patient over, again, for, a, for a four time, four years uh, a period, always sticking the same radio artery. So if you use the right technique to get access and to close, you can stick as many times as the radio artery. However, if you use the wrong technique, there will be occlusion of the radio artery and then you will not be able to come back. Uh, you can use for Y90 for the water cup in infusion. Typically, we do that seven to 10 days apart. We have used radio access for visceral aneurysms, for GI bleeding, for trauma, for angiomyolipoma, for pre-renal cancer embolization, for UFE, for prostatic artery embolization, for uterine, for internal iliac artery uh, aneurysm embolization, for upper extremity bone cancer pre-op embolization, thyroid embolization, bronchial artery embolization, for trauma radiation. mentioned. For trauma is something interesting because you don't need to deal with the binder. Most of these people that have a trauma in the pelvis, they have a binder a closing the femoral access site, and then you don't need to mess up with the binder. You can leave the binder in place and get access radio. The only thing you have to be careful with the radio access in trauma is if the patient has any history of intracranial trauma, you don't want to give heparin to those patients because then they can have bleeding intracranially. And of course, for visceral artery disease, like uh, stenosis of the celiac artery, SMA, or renals. So the typical devices that we use for uh, celiac trunk, SMA, and renals nowadays, uh, we have a radio kit, so a specific kit, uh, the one we use is from Turumo, uh, with is called Slender. It's an extremely thin uh, kit. Uh, for example, this pink and gray, it's a, the inner diameter is a five range, but the outer diameter is four. So how the inner diameter can be bigger than the outer diameter? The secret is basically they made the, the wall very thin, and that's why you can load a bigger device than the outer diameter. Uh, and then typically we follow with the microcatheters, uh, 150, and at the end we use the TR band, this one in the patient's wrist, to close the hole. Basically there's a balloon in here insufflating, insufflated that closes, compresses the artery. Um, also, in the last few years, we have uh, stopped using the MPA and we are using more. We have developed two catheters, the MG1 and MG2. Uh, I developed with the Rumo. Uh, for full disclosure, I don't make any money of those catheters, but we helped to develop this. 
in order to have better device in the market. So we've been using nowadays the MG1 or MG2. MG1 more for upper upper abdomen, for the liver, renals, in SMA, and for UFE, for PAE, we're using the MG2. One important thing that we developed at MUSC is to have some criteria to use radioaxis. We don't use radioaxis in everybody. We are very, we're more careful when the patient is elderly patient, above say 70 years old, you can say, why not 65 or not 75? Well, you need to pick a date, a uh, date, no, uh, uh, a near, uh, an age. So we picked at 70 years old. We are very careful there and more, more likely because those people more likely will have uh, calcifications in the aortic arch. Um, history of stroke. I don't know if the stroke came from the heart or from the plaque or from the, or the subclavian. We're going to be careful with that. So the history of stroke, we're more careful. And also, of course, if the patient has heavily calcified aortic arch. However, if the patient has, let's say, 85 years old and has colon cancer, and we can treat that colon cancer with, let's say, Y90, and the patient, because of the stage, and the patient has a chest CT, and the chest CT shows no calcification in the aortic arch, I will do the case, uh, in, even in an, uh, over 70 years old. But then I have the CT available to show me if there is cal there are calcifications or not. But uh, on the other hand, I will never order a chest CT just to check calcification of the aortic arch. But if the patient, and most of the patients, because of their staging, they have a chest CT, so I always check to make sure that there is no heavily calcified aortic arch. If it, the arch is clear, then we, we can use radioaxis regardless of the patient's age. Uh, another important factor to uh, um, to take into account is to make sure the patient's eligible. Now, this is about safety. Now, we're talking about the Barbo test and the ultrasound test. Uh, there are some uh, more recent movements, especially in the neurointerventional world uh, and in cardiology, to not basically to abandon doing Barbo test. I think that's a big mistake. I respect the ones who don't want to do it, but I think it's a big mistake. And the reason is because if it happens, if there, there's ischemia in the patient's finger, then that's 100% of risk in that patient, right? So you want to minimize that, even though Barbo test is negative in a minimum amount of patients. So how do you do Barbo test and why do you do that? Number one, you want to make sure that if there is, Nathan, can you see my arrow? I can see the red arrow that's pointing at the pulse ox on his finger. Can you see my black arrow now moving? No, I don't see the one moving. Okay. So during the Barbot test, what you want to see is if there is occlusion, thank you. If there is a occlusion of the radio artery during the case or after the case, you want to make sure that the, the first and second fingers that are vascularized by the radio artery, that those two fingers are not going to be under threat. Typically, the first and second fingers are vascularized by the radio artery. The fourth and fifth fingers are vascularized by the owner. And the middle finger can be either one of them, can be the radio or owner. If there's a huge variation there. Um, so to do the Barbo test, what you need to do is to compress both radio and owner. And when you do the radio and owner, uh, basically, if the wave is flat, with the base, the wave will be flat, as you can see in the second picture to the right, 99 and 93. That's when you hold pressure in both, the wave becomes flat. When you release the owner, when you release the owner while you're holding pressure on the radio, if the wave comes back, meaning that there is a complete palmar arch, the wave will be normal, like you can see on the 99, 89 image. So if you see a flatten of the wave as you hold pressure in the owner and radio, you release the owner and the wave comes back means what? That the pulse detector placed in the first or second fingers is detecting the wave across the palmar arch that is complete. So that's a positive Barbo test. This takes less than 30 seconds and extremely safe. Dr. Barbo is a cardiologist, a French cardiologist who developed this technique. He developed those, created those four types of wave, type A, B, and C, you're good to go. There's a little bit of dumping, there's a little bit of decrease in the amplitude. But if the wave is flat, like, like you can see in D, then that's a contraindication to radio access. That's a Barbo negative test. 
The second important thing that we do here as a routine, and you're going to see that around the world, not everybody does this way, but we do here. We measure the AP diameter, inner, inner wall of the radial artery. Cheating is not allowed. It. You have to be careful not to compress the radial artery too, too much. Otherwise, you create a fish mouth. And if it's bigger than 1.6 millimeters in AP diameter, then we can use the pink and gray sheath that I mentioned to you, the slender sheath. That 1.6 millimeters is enough to put the sheath without any problem, okay? If you're going to use a bigger sheath, let's say slender 5.6 to use angioplasty, to use for a stent placement, then you need a 2.4 millimeter radial artery. So it's important to measure the radial artery from my perspective because then you can see how compatible the device is with the radial artery and you won't have an artery on a stick, which is something that can happen in case you don't care about measuring the radial artery up front. So those two things, barbo test and radio artery, is routine. None of our patients go to the table, at least my patients, go to the table without having barbo test and ultrasound. Always. And that's what we've been doing the last nine years. So from my perspective, contraindications for uh, radio artery, RAFI means radio artery in vascular interventions, in visceral interventions, is basically if the artery is too small for the sheath, bigger is smaller than 1.6 millimeters or if the barbo test is negative everything else is just possible uh, is, is controversial contraindication so how do you set up the lab as you can see here you have the operator in the upper middle picture you can have one of our uh, fellows in the past that was working behind the shield and you can see here now he's fully protected that that's that works like a door on wheels and that's why we, doing this way, you can have a threefold reduction in radiation exposure. We also like to put a, 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 a rolled towel underneath the patient's wrist, hyperextend the wrist, so we can have a, 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 and also tape around the patient's hand. You can see to fix the patient's hand so we can have access very safely. And you can see in the other two pictures on the right, we can work behind the shield without any problem very comfortably. A question that is frequently we have in our course, we have a monthly course at the MUSC, a monthly, no, now is every quarter, course of radio at the MUSC, there's a frequent question, which is, can we do a spin? Can you do rotation in geography? Yes, you can, look at look at this picture, right? So when the arm, the arm was open throughout the case, when you need to do a spin, you just bring the patient arm, you tuck it against the patient's torso, like you can see here, and then you can do the spin without a problem. So we typically do procedures trans radio through the left radio artery, not the right. And the reason is two reasons. One is the distance between the right, right subclavian artery and the descending aorta, or the left subclavian artery and the descending aorta, is about four inches longer on the from the right side. So you're losing length of catheters. That's why we created the MG1 and MG2. They are long enough today. But in the past, we didn't have long catheters, and then that was a big problem. Second reason, and that's the most important reason why we don't want to we don't want to uh, go through the right side, is because we don't want to cross the superaortic vessels, the origin of the superaortic vessels, and necessarily and potentially create a stroke on the table. So that's why we go for the left. If you go subdiaphragmatic, you go through the left side. Of course, if the patient has a trauma on the right side of the neck, right chest right arm with cancer that needs to be embolized, then I will stick the right radio artery. But then I'm not going to be crossing the superaortic vessels. Does it make sense? Another important detail is you can see these x-ray on the left, left lower quadrant. The reason why we want to stick up one or two centimeters above the styloid process. Styloid process is that bump you can see in the bone, right? There next to the to the to the wrist. That radial bump is where the styloid process, you can palpate the styloid process in your hand, in your wrist, and one or two centimeters above it, that's where you should stick. So palpate the bump, one or two centimeters above, okay? And then why we want to go in that area? Because if you see this x-ray, that's exactly where the radial radius bone is wider. Can you see there? So you want, similar to what we do in the common femoral, you want to have a solid surface posteriorly to the puncture side where we can hold pressure in case you need to hold pressure with your hand. In the radio axis, we don't hold pressure with our hands. We use a balloon, a, a band that holds pressure against, but it needs to have a solid surface 
to help you to help obtain good hemostasis. As you can see, the ulnar can also be uh, used for radio access, but it has a little narrower uh, head of the ulnar bone. So it is not preferential. That's why we prefer to do radio access through the radio, radio and not through the ulnar. This picture on the left lower quadrant of the screen, you can see there I counted once, there are 15 punctures in this patient's wrist. This in 2022 is totally unacceptable. I think it's important to use ultrasound guidance for any type of access we have, either arterial, venous, kidney, liver. We need to use every single tool available to increase our safety and precision. It's not about how good I am or somebody else is about the patient, right? It's in every single tool that can be adding, that can add uh, uh, safety should be used. So ultrasound guidance is critical. The second tip that I'd like to share is instead of having a 45 degrees that we typically do for radio access, for femoral access, you have got to go a little flatter. And the reason is about 30 degrees because you want to have a longer segment between the skin puncture site and the artery. So the, uh, the needle that is short needle, as you can see in the left upper picture, the short needle, the transparent hub, that's the one they use for radio access. You want to have a flatter, so you have more distance between the skin and the artery that provides more stability. The picture on the right side shows uh, an introducer sheath already in the radio artery, and you can see a dressing there, transparent and green. That dressing is critical to be placed as soon as you are intravascular because the sheaths are hydrophilic. Hydrophilic means they're very slippery. And if you don't put a sheath, you can might have the sheath outside of the patient's body in a heartbeat. So better to put a sheath to be secure. In order to prevent the spasm and thrombosis of the radio artery, we use uh, basically three drugs. And most of the case, we use two of them, especially if you do liver directed therapy. So the general principle here is, if you're going to get access once in a vessel, like let's say uh, Y90 or chemoembolization, you get access to the celiac trunk, and then from there you just go with a microcatheter, right, changing from one order to another, then you don't need uh, verapamil. Just a nitroglycerin, 200 micrograms at the beginning of the case, and then 200 micrograms at the end of the case, and it's enough to provide good prophylaxis for a spasm. Uh, however, if you are going to use a catheter multiple times going back and forth, for example, let's say you're doing a, a prostatic autoembolization or uterine autoembolization, and you need to move the catheter from one side to another, basically moving the catheter from different positions, that maneuver can have a spasm. And if you can have a spasm, you need to use verapamil. Remember, nitro is going to last about uh, five to 10 minutes in the body and then goes away. Verapamil is about 45 minutes half-life. So during that time, you prevent the spasm in case you need to change from one position to another. So if we use, if we are going to do, let's say, new FE or prostatic artery embolization, we're going to use verapamil 2.5 milligrams at the beginning of the case only. However, if you use nitro, for example, in liver directed therapy that you put one catheter, park the catheter into the celiac and you don't move anymore, then you just need to use nitro at the beginning at the end, 200 microns. Regarding prevention of clot formation, if it's a liver directed therapy, again, only one, only one axis, minimal amount of time, about an hour, we're done. We usually give 3,000 of heparin and then game over. If you're going to continue with the case that takes longer than an hour, at the 30 minutes mark, we're going to give another 1,000 of heparin, and subsequently, every 30 minutes, 1,000 of heparin to prevent clot formation. If you are going to do a case that requires to move the catheter around, again, UFE or prostatic artery embolization, we moved from three to 5,000 units. More heparin because those, those procedures are typically longer and can also have more spasm and clot formation, so we use more heparin. At the beginning of the case, another tip is to use iodine contrast to inject a little bit of contrast, like five, five six cc's of, of contrast at the beginning through the sheath as soon as you get access. Why? I wanna have an idea of what I'm dealing with. So I wanna see how big the radio artery is. Left upper quadrant, there's a long spasm. 
the left lower quadrant, there's a short spasm. You can see tortuosity now, significant tortuosity in the right upper quadrant. You can have a high takeoff, which is the middle picture on the right side, high takeoff of the radial artery, takeoff at the axillary pit. You can also have a kink, which is the right lower picture showing a kink. That's not a spasm, it's a kink in the radial artery. So I want to make sure that I know what's what, I, what I'm dealing with so we can you know, deal with those situations in different ways. Uh, and one of the tricks to go through this spasm or through this kink is just to advance a micro guide wire, you advance a micro catheter, get everything straight, and then you can advance your five French catheter, for example. Uh, here, uh, another tip is to uh, use fluoroscopy for the entire time while you advance in the catheter to the descending aorta. Fluoroscopy the entire time. One of the reasons why some people can have stroke is because we're playing, some people are playing with the guide wire and catheter in the aortic arch, not using fluoro. We don't do that at MUSC. We use fluoroscopy for the entire time while you're advancing from the wrist all the way down to the descending aorta. At the end of the case, we like to use a TR band or some sort of compression device. There are several compression devices in the market. We use this on the right lower quadrant called TR band. It has a balloon on the uh, and inside, and after you have the, the band placed around the patient's wrist, you inflate that band in a way that you don't want to have excessive amount of insufflation. This is the removal of the sheet at the end of the case. That's a small video there. And you can see that the band, the tear band, has a green marker right there in that spot. That green marker goes a little bit above the arteriotomy of the patient's skin. And then you go in, in a snug fashion, you go around the patient's wrist and you inflate air. If you inflate air and you walk away, more likely that's going to cause radio artery occlusion. What you need to do is to inflate air and then you need to compress the uh, ulnar artery to make sure that the radio artery is not excessively inflated, okay? If the radio artery is excessively inflated and you stop, you hold pressure in the ulnar, there will be no flow being detected in the oximetry pulse. But if you have uh, a mild compression of the owner, uh, sorry, of the radio, and while you are holding pressure on the owner and there is pulse, means what? You have patent hemostasis. That's what we call patent hemostasis. By image, those two images on the upper part, the, those are MRIs in volunteers. That's a study we did many years ago. On the left side, you see the radio artery partially compressed. You see the balloon inflated with this the green, the green there. And you can see there is signal in the radio artery just below the red uh, arrow. You can see there the white artery. And then on the right side, you see there is an excessive amount of balloon insufflated. That's why you don't see any signal at all. The image on the right side is associated with radio artery occlusion. In this case here, we are removing now air, a little bit more of air, and we're going to hold pressure again in the owner. And holding pressure in the owner, if there's not excessive amount of radio insufflation, you can see the wave is back. This is patent hemostasis. I know in this video might be a little complicated what I'm explaining, but when you guys come to train with us, we'll be able to, to deal with that. Also, radio access can be good if you're going to do endoleak treatment or if you're going to treat, for example, patients with a retroperitoneal pseudoaneurysm. We have done cases that you can have dual access. In this case, the patient is in a superman position on this table. Superman position means in prone position and the palm is up, right? So we can get access here, dual access. You can have access to the patient's left arm. You can see there, left arm is exposed, left wrist is exposed and prepped, tucked against the torso. You can also have the patient's lumbar region prepped. So for uh, endoleak, for example, you can have access intra-arterial, intravascular access, and also you can go percutaneous access to treat the sac. So that's one of the advantages of radio access when you can have simultaneous radio and translumbar. So to finalize, we created seven pillars of radio access, and this is something that we published at the JVIR, Journal of Vascular Intervention Radiology, as standards of radio access. An important paper, uh, our resident Tony uh, uh, Gayed helped us to write that paper, and this is a reference in the country today in terms of how you could perform radio access safely. The seven pillars include, and this is the, uh, just a summary of what we talked about, 
is patient selection. We discussed about patients that are elderly without any CT. I don't do radio access. If the patient can be 80 years old that has a clear CT, I do radio access. You screening with barbo barbo test and the ultrasound. A room set up to protect you, putting a shield between you and the radiation source. Use the ultrasound for guidance. Don't stick the radio order without ultrasound guidance. A little lower, 30 degrees. Use fluoroscopy during the entire time when you are advancing the catheter and guide wire from the sheath all the way down to the descending aorta. Use heparin and nitro, in some cases, verapamil as well, to prevent clot and, spa and spasm prevention. And at the end of the day, at the end of the case, perform patent hemostasis to make sure that the radio order will be open and you can bring the patient back as many times as needed. Nathan, I will stop here. So, um, everybody can start asking questions now, but I'll weed it off because I have a question off the top of my head. Um, so, I, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Gamera, because I saw like a complication due to radial access and all vascular surgery. And what had happened was, I guess, I think thinking back on it now after you hit listen to your lecture is that he has sized all this stuff because he was originally trying to go through the brachial artery and then like last minute kind of decided to do a radial access. And so I think all the stuff was like too big in the first place. And then there was spasm as well. But I guess comparing like brachial access versus radial access, like what are the pros for going through the radial artery as compared to the brachial? I know that like he had told me something about like um, you can get a lot more permanent nerve damage if brachial goes wrong. Like you, you have an issue with a brachial access compared to radial, but like comparing the two access points in the arm, like why would you choose one over the other? Radio versus brachial? Yeah. So brachial access, first of all, in my practice, I don't remember the last time I used brachial, to be honest with you. Maybe it was in 2003, 2004, last time that I used. Um, I don't think you need to use brachial access at all. Um, the only reason that I would use today is, let's say that I want to place a seven-frame sheath to put a, then the only reason why it would be a seven frame sheath would be to put a cover stent, a large cover stent, let's say for whatever reason, the SMA, that it is an aneurysm in the ostium of the SMA. And then I'm gonna I need to put a cover stent, for example. Then I might consider, first of all, I would use femoral if I can. Now we use uh, brachial. And let's say patient has bilateral occlusion of the femoral and I need to treat that aneurysm and the only access that I have will be a brachial. Then no, I'll go brachial. But I think it's extremely dangerous access, more complications than reported. There's a study done in, in, in many years ago, may, I mean, more than 20 years ago, in which one of the first studies of per, percutaneous coronary interventions that compare radio femoral and radio femoral and uh, uh, radio femoral and brachial. The incidence of complications and brachial is about 6% versus femoral 2% and radio was 0% in that study, using a six frame sheet. So that gives you a sense of how bad it is, radio brachial access. And it's also it's difficult to obtain control, uh, control of hemostasis. Uh, some people have used a closure device, for example, to close the hole in the brachial artery. I would discourage, unless the patient has a huge brachial artery, which is not the case for the most part, but if it's a normal brachial water, which is small and smaller than five millimeters, then I would avoid using a um, uh, uh, closure device and just hold pressure. And so what, um, I mean, in that talk, uh, what or in that article, like what did they discuss on like why the, why the incidence of complications is so high with brachial? Cause like he told me something and I don't know if maybe it's just like, it's hard, well, like you said, it's harder to control and they get worse compartment syndrome. And so they get a lot more like, if he talked about like permanent nerve damage and things like this from maybe just like worse compartment syndrome, but like what were the specific reasons on like why it's so much worse than the other access points? Because you, you can't control, there's no, where the, where the artery is, you, you can control against the surface, a solid surface against like you can find in the common femoral and in the radial access. And, and there's way more flexibility of the artery around the bone there, so you, it's harder to obtain a one focal point of pressure, right? Also, there's way more tissue similar to the femoral where you can have hematoma differently than in the wrist. The wrist has not much space, right? 
it bleeds a little bit, it's going to bleed and it's going to be di dissecting a little bit of the plane, right, with blood, and that's it. It's not going to accumulate a lot of blood in the patient's wrist. So um, those are the main reasons. It's difficult to obtain control. Or and then, um, just to, God, I'm hogging the airways, but I, I'm just on a roll here. I had my questions prepped before we had this lecture, but so when, when for, when, if you were to kind of, let's say it spasmed on you, even though we kind of go through everything that we should, but you know, strange things happen. It spasmed on you and then you tore the radial. Like when, when are you at the point where you're calling plastics? Cause like that complication, I saw, you know, they tried to control it. They tried to see if they could embolize the radial. Cause ideally, you know, I, I just, I think they did the Barbo test. And they, I'm a, I hope they did the Barbo test. I wasn't in there if they did do it, but like, they tried to embolize the radio and then you can just leave the owner and it will perfuse everything ideally um if you got a nice loop uh um you know arterial loop down there but like when are you calling plastics for whenever you have a complication well i think uh, if i would call vascular surgery in case i had a complication like this right first of all because if they need to ligate or the bypass whatever uh, i would defer this to to vascular surgery. I think plastic surgery would be better for reconstruction if you need to re redo a bypass, you know, using the microscopic lenses, all that stuff. Um, I think more important than plastic surgery is to call vascular surgery. But more important than to call those guys, I don't want to call any of them. And I haven't called any of them doing over, you know, 1,500 uh, cases in the last uh, nine years. And the reason is prevention is the best medicine, right? Prevention is the best way to go. So if you do the right technique, and, and again, I don't want to play here that we are right and, and somebody else is wrong, but it's not my point. But my point is we've been doing this for with consistency in the last nine years, and we have had good results. Not good, great results. So I would just share with you my experience. I don't have data to prove every single thing that I'm telling you here, but with common sense and experience, that's what we've been doing and has worked well. Awesome. I have more questions, but I'll let other people ask them. And I'll ask my other ones. Um, hey, Dr. Gumares. Uh, so, just a quick question about, and, and this is more of if you've received pushback on this, especially when you guys were making this more of a standardized protocol, uh, was the use of fluoroscopy constantly. Um, you had mentioned earlier that the shield is, is good for the operator. Um, did you guys receive any pushback? Uh, like for increased floor time for the patient. Um, I mean, obviously there's there's increased you know risks of not having floor on, but I am I am just wondering if you guys ever received pushback for that. Never received pushback, and the data in from our study and from others, including the meta analysis that I showed you, show that there's no difference in fluoroscopy time and in radiation exposure to the patient when you compare radio versus femoral. Awesome. Good question. Um, one, one question I had is, um, I'm trying to think how to work it. Is there a difference in success rate between like either just uh, gaining access between like radial and femoral or either just like complications that happen that you have to like that the procedure is just not successful because of the access point and if so do you think that's just comes from a lack of experience because it sounds like a lot of the tips you were giving were like this is how you should be doing it do you feel like it's just approached wrong often and that's why there might be some increased complications i think i think if 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 I understand your question correctly, if there is a perception that radio access has more complications, it's definitely related to the lack of technique, adequate technique. Uh, if you do the right technique like we've been doing and, just in, and follow every single step, and that's why we, just, we created the seven steps of radio access, because if you follow those seven steps, you're not going to have a complication. One thing that is I didn't mention here, but it's something that I have seen in the past, is, is people dealing with the radio artery catheter, uh, moving the catheter too aggressively. That can also create spasm. So you have to have a delicate maneuver going back and forth and finding the artery that you want to go and taking the time to do it. Um, but it's a super elegant technique. Uh, the patients love it. The patients can walk outside of the room if you want to, right after the case. As long as they are awake enough, they could walk outside of the room. Um, and it's extremely safe. But if, if there's a perception of more complicated or more complications, it's just based the, the, the operator is not taking the time to follow the right technique. 
And if you follow that, you'll be just fine. Kind of, kind of going off this point, and then I think obviously you had um, I mean, kind of pay, uh, plays a little bit into the project that I'm doing for you, but talking about delays and maximizing efficiency for procedures and how you can get people in and out. So kind of a twofold question, just um, currently, how long do we keep patients after radial access like to observe them? About two hours, two hours and a half. Okay. Uh, and then, but what, if you, but but there's a so just to complete the, no, no, it's okay just to complete the thought. But there's a, a protocol that uh, and we are we're working on that now. That if you um, you can dis discharge the patient after one hour. So after one hour you can discharge the patient, send the patients home. So if you do that, then you definitely can make a big difference from the economic standpoint, right? Also, radio access is amazingly successful, have been as amazingly successful in the OBL world. OBL is off based, office based laboratory, labs, right? Not based on the hospital, based on the office, right? And OBLs are discharging patients no matter an hour, an hour and a half, or two hours, max going home, fast throughput, cases being getting done. And it's super convenient for the patients that are going through UFE or prostate, prosthetic or embolization or, you know, uh, liver directed therapies, for example. Very different than keeping the patient in the hospital for two hours, two hours and a half, and then, you know, having the patients laying flat and they cannot walk or they have discomfort in their groin is a total different experience. The reason why you saw in our study and in the meta analysis, a consistency in every five patients, four prefer radio is not for any reason, it's not a coincidence. The patients really have a good experience, especially in the design of our study, as was mentioned by Emily. Uh, patients had both accesses and then they could choose. So a super simple assessment, right? I hope it makes sense. Yeah, totally. And this is more... I intentionally keep this second question a little bit more vague because I'm curious what you have to say. But where do you think, like, if, I mean, obviously this is from the way you're describing it, and I totally believe you, and I think you have the data to prove it, you know, that if this is a superior access point for a lot of procedures, except maybe if you got to get some very large devices in through, um, through the radial artery, you probably should go femoral. But other than just size criteria, like if this was the most widely adopted access point, how do, what do you see for the future of patients whenever they inter, inter, interact with the interventional radiology department? I think they're going to have more and more uh, radio access. And the people who don't, don't do that frequently today uh, around the world is because either personal preference, not because the patient's preference, but the physician's preference. Maybe they don't feel comfortable. Or they, there's a perception. We wrote a paper actually on that. What's the perception, the misperceptions of physicians? Why some physicians don't use radio access, right? So one of the, the things was the misperception that is more complicated. The other misperception was uh, there's no data enough to prove that is good. This is old concept. If you re, if you're updated with the literature, there's enough literature today showing different applications in UFV and trauma in the radio embolization, chemo embolization, uh, that radio acts is the way to go, prosthetic artery embol, UFE is the way to go. So I think it's a matter of time, and also sometimes it's, it's hard to teach uh, a new trick to an old dog, right? Um, that can happen. Um, and But you guys being young, you need to embrace what is minimally invasive and what's best for patients. Not what's best for you, what's best for the patient. Also, there's another concept that is going to be harder when you guys are on the top of your career, which is the consumerism. Uh, more and more patients are going to be uh, getting like a menu on the hospital website. And the menus say, well, we do here UFE, transradio, we do UFE, transfemoral. Uh, here's the expenses, here's your recovery time, here's your um, uh, cost, here's the incidence of complications. 
and this there will be more transparency in the future about this. Some of our hospitals, some systems in the country are already embracing this consumerism concept at the max capacity. Now, then the patients are coming and say, well, I want to have my UFV. No, I want to have my fibroid managed not by surgery, not by drugs, but by embolization. Second step, I want to have my access radio, not ferro, because they will have access to the data. If they have access to the data, there's no discussion. Understand? So it's important for you guys to be to have an open mind to understand what is the patient's preference, because the patient will be going where they want to go. It's different, similar to a restaurant. Oh, I want to eat Italian food tonight. OK, I'm going to go to an Italian restaurant and not to go to a restaurant, knock at the door like in a hospital today and say, what do you have? What type of food do you have for me? That's the way it is today in the hospital. The doctor chooses what they want to do. What they will do for you and not the patients there. There will be a change that is an expected change on that. Especially if you go to work in very competitive markets like Boston, New York, Philadelphia. I hear stories all the time of physicians, colleagues of ours that are offering radio access and they're developing they're increasing their market share in those very competitive markets because they offer radio access where that's what the patients want actually they can put that in their marketing tool and say hey you can get out of the hospital get out of our obl our office-based lab in about you know uh, one hour or in 90 minutes we're hitting the door this is this is the future of medicine i have no doubt about that and not you know big devices and, and skipping the patients at the hospital. I just have a quick question um, regarding, and I don't, I'm not sure if you spoke to this at length, but you know, speaking to the future of you know this radio access, how do you in, interpret this being incorporated into the pediatric population? Because um, we've talked about a lot of other risks uh, in an adult population, and much of IR is spreading wide and far in the adult world. And I know that Dr. Yamada does some in the pediatrics. I'm not super familiar um, with that world, but right. how do you think this could apply? That's a great question. I think applies the same rule, right? So uh, I think the, the companies are bringing new devices that are smaller in profile. So for example, we're gonna have soon a four French uh, system, maybe even three French systems uh, that could be used in kids. Um, I would say is the same criteria. Use the barbell test, do the check the diameter of the radio artery. Will be smaller than 1.6 for sure, right? Uh, think about three French is basically one millimeter. So you can drop the number 1.6 to potentially, I would give a little cushion, maybe 1.2. So in kids, if you have a three French system, maybe you can use uh, if the artery is 1.2 bigger millimeters. Um, but it's definitely not, I don't think it's ready, if, I don't think it's ready for prime time in pediatrics because of the supplies. I think it's ready for prime time in adults, big time. Yes, but not for kids. I think that smaller devices need to be developed. And the same thing for kids, in adults, there will be lower profile devices in the future that will make the radio access even more accessible to different people. I, I challenged the company about six years ago that in 2030 they should be doing AAA stain graft transradio. They need to make the device small enough. So we'll see. We'll see if they can get that then. I have a question. Yeah. Just to it would be nice, right, to have a, 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 an endograft placed through a radio artery and you go home the same day. I mean, that would be, be blowing anybody's mind. I have a question for you as well, just to clarify for myself. Um, so whenever you talked about the calcification of the of the aortic or of the aortic arch, were you mostly just con talking about like concerning if there's like a like um a stenosis near the origin of like the subclavian that eventually you're going to get up into? So it just would it just would make it more difficult for you to access the aorta, or you or is there something else with calcification in the aortic arch that you're worried about? Well, is is that what I'm worried about is is to have a plaque on the way that is unstable or a clot in attached to a plaque, and then as I'm passing with a wire and catheter, I can mobilize that, and then you have a distal migration to the brain and potentially stroke on the table. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm concerned about. 
Okay. Uh, if it's just a stenosis that I can go through and treat it, etc., it's fine. I we've done it in the past, right? But again, I don't want to be playing with with fire here. Why I'm going to be doing an angioplasty if the patient's symptomatic? Okay. I've done I've done subclavian uh, left subclavian artery occlusion transradial, and it's a 15 minutes procedure. Super simple. Especially you're protected because then you have reversal of the ver vertebral artery flow. Yep. Right? So they are protected against stroke. But it's still, I don't want to, if the patient is asymptomatic, let's say patient is coming for um, um, uh, liver directed therapy, Y90, for example. I don't want to be doing an angioplasty in the left subclavian artery if, it's, if the patient is totally asymptomatic. Um, and then as well, my final question. Uh, so with the with that slide that you showed, the Barbo test, it looked like there was like two lines on like one side. Was that just showing like the difference in time, like once you release your fingers from that, or were those two like separate lines? I thought they were just kind of showing like the O2 sets, but I wasn't sure. Right. If I was reading so, that correctly. so the line that has a normal amplitude, a wide amplitude, that's a normal wave, right? When you're holding pressure in both radial and ulnar, the wave should be flat. Mm -hmm. Got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. You'll hold pressure in both. Let's see my hand here. I'm going to make, make this with my hand. So I'm holding pressure in both, and I have a detector in my first, second fingers, one of those two fingers. Then if I hold pressure in both, there will be no pulse detected. Agree with that? Yep. Okay. So if I am going to simulate, that's why you do the Barbeau test. I'm going to simulate an occlusion of the radial artery during the case or after the case, All right? So I'm going to hold pressure in the, in the radio and in the honor, and I want to simulate an occlusion now. So I'm going to release the honor, okay? Release the honor. If the wave is back, it means what? That the palmar arch, the palmar arch is complete. So there's blood coming from the honor around the arch and is feeding the first or second fingers. So there's no threat to have ischemia on the patient's fingers. Does this make sense to you? Yes. So, however, that uh, 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 continuity of the palmar arch is variable. Different size, different lengths, etc. different uh, anastomosis between the ulnar and the uh, radio and in the palmar arch. So remember, you have the deep palmar arch and superficial palmar arch, right? And, and they have different sizes and different communication. So, the reduction in the amplitude, which is barbo A, barbo B, or barbo C, is to take those vari vari variations of the perfusion into account. But if the patient does not have a complete palmar arch, the, the owner, the radial branches do not communicate with the owner branch. There's an interruption in the middle. Then if you are holding pressure on the radio and you release the owner, there will be no pulse whatsoever in the detector. And that's Barbo D. To me, that's a contraindication to do radio X because there's a high chance, and there has been described, patients with ischemia of the patient's hand because the person probably, the doctor, did not check the Barbo test. Um, I had one last question, um, and maybe this goes back to one of the principles where you mentioned the diameter of the, or, uh, of, of the vessel. Like... Um, is there any contraindication to like low flow states because you're talking about trauma? So in like some sort of a hypovolemic state or people with a cardiac output, like, min like minimal cardiac output, that it's better to have ephemeral access just because of the size, I guess, of the vessel? It, it, that's a great question. Uh, that's why you need to match the diameter. So if the diameter, regardless, I've done trauma patients in the past, and if the, some of the trauma, trauma, trauma patients, especially if they're bleeding, they have the arteries clamped down, right? Basic spasm. So if the artery is bigger than 1.6, equal or bigger than 1.6, I do radio access. Yeah. Regardless the vasospasm spasm in, in, in lack of uh, or low ejection fraction that happens, Everything's about the diameter. And if the diameter is compatible, good to go. 
in, in a trauma situation like that, I guess, is it common for you to see an arterial line put in already for like measuring? Um, yeah, yeah, so it's not uncommon for them to ask us at the end to leave an arterial line for them. Okay, two and one. <laughs> Great questions, guys. Yeah, you got any more on? No. All righty. Well, I think that's all of our questions. We are we are finally done bombarding you. Um, otherwise, I appreciate you coming to present on it. I I personally like these more te te like we weren't a lot of like you know the kind of the pathophysiology lectures, which are cool too. But I think it's good to get exposed to these more technical lectures because we don't get to see that a lot like just from our learning and a lot of it is like you know everything technical how you fill it with your hands and things like that so i really appreciate you coming to talk to us dr Gamera. no problem be glad to to talk to you guys anytime we have other topics if you want to uh and we have to contribute to this group as much as needed um i don't know if you know this the history the history of this group but i i created this group with one of the medical students that actually sent to me an email the other day he's going to um, um oregon if i'm not wrong and and this is many years ago and it's a, it's cool to see the history back that he started years ago with with me and you guys kept the ball rolling so that's phenomenal keep it up yes sir let thank me know you, what you. to help you guys in the future. Totally. Yeah, thank thanks, Dr. Gamers. Bye. Take care.